Brother Matthew's text tonight is James 1.21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. The true value of the engrafted word can only be realized when certain conditions are met. In order to really benefit from the word of God, James says that there are things that we must lay aside, things that there is no longer any room for, in order for the word to bear fruit in our lives, the weeds of sin must be uprooted first. And we can't benefit from our study of the word if we continue to dwell on things that engage in wickedness and are spiritually filthy. It's commanded that we receive the word. It's not talking about just receiving it once, and that's all. We must continuously receive it and always be in a position to receive it. And this word needs to be implanted in us. Um, we must receive it with meekness. Meekness is a characteristic of Christ Jesus, and the Lord's people must have this trait as well. A humble and receptive attitude is essential to get the most out of the Word of God. Amen. Anyone convicted and then forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Christ is in a position to produce <coughs> this godly meekness. It says the engrafted Word is to be part of us. And without the reception of the message, then men cannot be saved. The Word of God is a saving word. Now, um, Brother Matthew is going to come up and speak more to us about this, the engrafted word and, that is able to save our souls. Amen. <clears throat> our brother James here uh, begins our verse by reminding us of this truth that um, it is possible for you to be in a condition where you cannot receive from God. That there, there, are, there are some things that have to be taken care of before we come to God to receive anything. This has uh, been um, opened, us to, opened up to us even, even all the way back uh, to um, the law. We, we, we realized this, that there was some preparation that had to be done before they could go into the holy place. You know? there, there are things that had to be done if there was, someone was going to approach God. And John the Baptist knew this too, and he called people to bring forth fruits, meet for repentance, you know. Uh, stop the outbreak of sin. Show how serious you are about coming to the Lord. That um, uh, Jesus told the woman caught in adultery. He, he showed her mercy, but after he showed her, showed her mercy, he told her, go and sin no more. Uh, this is the nature of the kingdom. Uh, this is the stance one must be in to even enter in. Uh, to, to, so James in our text, he's reminding us of this, that when he delivers this admonition, that this is how we enter in, and even as, as we're in, this is how we continue to, to lay aside these things. Uh, lay apart all filthiness. Uh, to say that in more specific terms uh, for those who are in Christ, put off the old man. With his, with his, the affections and the lust thereof, and then put on the new man. Uh, don't allow your flesh to do what it does best and, and corrupt and defile. And put aside all superfluity of naughtiness. Uh, don't, that means don't allow it any expression. Uh, th this is the way that Paul said it. Don't make no provision for the flesh and uh, to fulfill the lusts thereof. See, when provision is made for the flesh, this is what happens. This is just a, a spiritual law. This, uh, the, the law of sin and death, you know, it, it happens. The lust thereof will be fulfilled. Uh, the idea is that iniquity, when it's allowed to take its course, it's like an overflowing, pulsating entity. It just overflows. It will fill a person with lust that cannot be contained. If it's allowed to continue, it will burst forth. It, it'll manifest itself in action. It's just a a matter of time. Uh, and the pervasive nature of iniquity, it doesn't leave any space for anything else. And when someone is filled with unrighteousness, there's no room in that person for righteousness. There's no room for the indwelling of the Spirit for someone who is a slave to sin, someone who is a slave to Satan. That, that There's no room for them to abide in Christ. So this, these things have to be rooted out. So then James, at the beginning of this text, he exhorts us to do some divine gardening, so to speak. To, to root up all these, these roots of sin in your life. Uh, the way that he says it is actually insightful. He isn't just saying the same thing uh, in two different ways. He says, he identifies the source and the outcome. Uh, re remove the filthiness. Remove the lust and the sinful thoughts and feelings within you. The things that, if entertained, overflow into this expression. And in doing so, you will ensure that the superfluity doesn't happen. Uh, this is a message that really needs to be preached to the church of our, our day. That, that uh, um, just if you want to stop the overgrowth, you have to kill the root. Yeah. 
This is what has to happen. Amen. And uh, this is the, 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 the spiritual diagnosis of so many of the counselors in our day. I, I feel like there's too much spiritual weed whacking going on, you know. You, gotta, you have to kill the root. You know, if, if, if they said that the Pharisees were whitewashed tombs, at the very best, the church is like a, it's like a weed whack patch of crabgrass, you know. <laughs> we need to get some, some spiritual roundup on this thing and just kill it. That's what needs to happen. Amen. So you can't really hide the word in a heart that's filled with the cares of this world. These things need to go. So then uh, root these things out and receive with meekness. Now to receive in this sense is to accept as authoritative, valid, true, or approved. Uh, one can't really receive the word in this sense passively. You don't receive the word like you receive a letter or receive a package where you can just receive it and then set it aside. You receive it like a, like a wide receiver receives the ball in a football game, you know. He receives that ball and, and he, he takes it to the goal, you know. There's, a, there's an intention for that. It's, in, it's, it's crucially important when he receives it to, to move forward with it. <laughs> And, and we receive this with meekness. Now this is the, the manner in which we must approach the Word of God. We don't, we don't haughtily and pridefully receive the Word. We come when we come to the Word of God with humbleness of spirit and with godly fear. And when we come to the Word of God, we don't come with our own predispositions and receive it on our own conditions. Uh, we come, we submit ourselves to the Word. It, it, if there's something that sounds foreign or, or odd, we examine ourselves to see what's wrong with the way in which we're seeing it, rather than being critical of it. We allow ourselves to be shaped by the Word of God, and, and we don't accept it on our own terms. I think this is one of the greatest maladies of the, uh, our current generation, uh, the way in which people approach and esteem the Word of God. We have so many people who they can't approach the Word of God without, without reservation and allow themselves to be subject to it. They can't accept it just for what it says. To consider it and believe it. Believe the things that it affirms and declares and then consider themselves within the context of that. This is a, really an evidence of the apparent lack of faith that exists all around us. Um, th I, I believe that this is really due largely to the work that the devil has done in our land. Uh, when we have this higher criticism and these, these word studies and with the differing techniques of hermeneutics and how do you interpret the Bible, you know, and uh, brethren, I say just let, let God be true and every man a liar. I think that that just ought to be a, the, the way that we look at it. The revelation that we have been given, it can and it ought to be taken and accepted in its entirety, literally and without reservation. Amen. This shouldn't even be a question. You should never have to ask anybody, well, do you take the Bible literally? <laughs> this is the, we're talking about the Word of God. Amen. I mean... It, the God of the universe has articulated His will and His purpose and His nature to us. How can we do anything but humbly accept it and, and, and uh, seek to know Him through it? Amen. So the reason why this is so important, this is such an issue to be seen, is um, uh, seen within the context of what James is about to affirm, that this is a word that when it becomes a part of you, it's able to save your soul. The gospel, this, the, the message of salvation, the report of what God has done in Christ Jesus and what He's doing in those who have been reconciled to Him, what He's doing in, in leading many sons to glory, this message is actually part of the means that He has employed to, to save men. So this is an engrafted word. This means this word is not like the words which were given by God on the day when Israel stood before Him on Mount Sinai. These were words that were written on tables of stone. That they were delivered to the people and they were commanded to the people. He says there, and uh, this is in Deuteronomy. This is just the nature of the covenant. You know, therefore you shall lay up, you shall lay up these words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign on your hand that they may as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall teach them to your children, speaking them when you sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt write them on the doorposts of thy house and upon nine gates. Well, why did he have to tell them all this? Because it wasn't written on their hearts. 
Uh, it, it, the law wasn't put into their hearts. God commanded them to lay it up in their hearts. You have to do it. The, the engrafted word is not on this wise. Now, to engraft is a process of joining together. It's to make one thing a part of another. And I wasn't really aware of it to the degree that I am now, but the, to engraft is a horticultural term. And it's a little different than to just join. It's to engraft in the agricultural sense is to join one tree or plant into another for the purpose of propagation. So the, the, the purpose for the joining is more the focus than the fact of that it was joined. So the, it's, it's that it's joined that the, it will grow, that it will produce fruit. This joining is done in expectation of a predetermined result, and that is bringing forth fruit. And Paul, he also speaks in this same kind of language when he says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So here the planting is done not merely to make what is planted one with the ground, but the, the thing that's planted in is planted in expectation of an upward growth. Amen. But even more than this, the grafting is not only done in expectation of the growth that will result, but of the manner of the growth. It's done for the purpose of changing the nature of what it has been joined to. Amen. Uh, when I was looking into this, I stumbled upon a, a, a website. It was a nursery website, and they were talking about grafting um, things into a root. And uh, they, they start out with a wild rootstock, right? And they'll cut a, a, a shoot off of a plant that they want to grow, and they'll graft this shoot into this wild rootstock, and the plant will grow up to be the plant that was grafted into it. I mean, what a glorious p uh, parallel this. This is exactly what's... We were a wild rootstock. Uh, he he graft, grafted in that divine nature. It was just good. It's an engrafted word. That, this word, when it's grafted, it, it produces a result in us. It does. It, it produces an offspring. And James talks about this even two verses earlier. He says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So in this sense, the Word itself actually plays a part in our birth. A God, in contrast to writing His laws and commandments in stone, He's, he's written them on our hearts now, and on the fleshly tablets of, of our hearts. And we receive this divine communication of the purpose and will of God, and we are allied with it now. We really are. We're not merely individuals who have chosen to believe. I mean, although this is true, it has changed who we are. Through our faith in the testimony of the work of Christ, we enter in. He uses the testimony as what has been done in salvation to draw men into his salvation. This, this word is what he's using. And as we believe and as we apprehend this divine communication of truth by faith, it creates this something within us. Now, this is the difference between what God has done in the past and now. Um, by saying what I have said about the Word being a means of salvation that He's bringing forth, I'm not implying that God's simply saying, uh, using His words like He did in the creation. When He said, let there be light, and there was light. He, he, could, he couldn't simply just say, let men be born again, and they were born again. It's, it's, this was too, too complicated. Much more work had to be done for this to be accomplished. Because first there was the issue of transgression. He had, he had to take away this sin that was in the way. Jesus had to come to earth as a man and die. And he had to raise up these witnesses through whom the truth could be testified of and recorded. And it had to be communicated in a way in which men could apprehend it. See, he had to create a means to show men what he had done. And this is the manner of salvation. He had to make known what he had done, or men would never have found him out themselves. Uh, if, you, if we didn't have the Word of God, we could have never come to the conclusion that we have a high priest you know, in heaven. We could have never come to the conclusion that we have an intercessor on high. You know, we, we, Men looking at Jesus dying on the cross could have never figured out, God is laying the sin of the world on Him for me. You know, These are things that God had to art articulate in His Word if we were going to be able to partake of them. 
Um, and this is just this is just the nature of man that God couldn't simply implant within them a testimony of the salvation that is in Christ Jesus for them to partake of the benefits of it. Men, they have to be able to see it for themselves. They have to be able to understand it and enter into it, and and to be able to God to achieve this desired effect in salvation. So this is an engrafted word that is able to save your souls. So God, he has employed the message of the gospel as the means to draw men into Christ. And the good news has gone out, and those who come unto him with a spirit of meekness, casting aside all of our pride, and we receive the word, we are saved by these things that we are testified of. And this is the way that he's chosen to do it. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the word is effective in what it has been uh, sent to do. Um, he says the word of God is quick and powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, <laughs> piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It is able to reveal unto us the truth of who we are, who we were, and who God is. It's able to cut through all of the nonsense, so to speak, all of the things of this world that confuse, to cut down to the real issues, the issues of life. And this word is actually able to save your souls. Uh, even as far back as Isaiah, we have this concept laid out when he says, Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live. Yes. And this is not only true initially, but those who are in Christ, they're, they're being led to glory and conformed into the image of Christ by means of their apprehension and knowledge of the things which are written of Christ and the salvation of, that's testified of Him in the Scriptures. It's, it's to the degree that we're able to comprehend the length and the breadth and the height and the depth thereof that we are transformed. As we are able to, to, to see Christ Jesus, to be able to see His face, we are transformed in the same image. And this is, this is how he does it, is through the Word. Amen. And not only does it play a significant role in our conversion, but in our continuance in Christ. We live by every word of God. Uh, this, is, this grafting is something that's delicate. It, this, this connection, it has to be maintained in order for the desired effect to be met. The graft, so to speak, must hold. I, I, they speak. Uh, Paul spoke about those whose graft didn't hold, so to speak, in the sixth chapter of Hebrews, and he he includes the word in here. He says, "For it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come." See, uh, when we're reckon, you have to maintain your appetite for the word of God. This is something that has to happen. It's necessary. You have to partake of it often. So you, you keep the taste of it in your mouth, so to speak. So when we're reconciled to God and cleansed from our unrighteousness and given the Holy Spirit and become a partaker of the divine nature, we're not fully matured at that point in time. See, the grafting has just begun to transform the root, so to speak. It has all of the potential to grow up into the, into the full fruit-bearing plant. All of it's there, but it needs the nourishment, it needs the light, it needs everything to be able to grow up into to full maturity. And it's, it's only as we behold the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus that this happens. So then, brethren, um, as we embark on this preaching festival and we, we, we talk about the, the Word of God, I, I exhort you to do as we talked about tonight, to do some spiritual gardening, so to speak, to, to be diligent to look for and to root up for any of these shoots that are stealing away your resources uh, and, and put yourself in a position to receive these resources that, that you need for this graft to hold, so to speak. Uh, stay in the sunlight and drink of this water that is flowing and that you might be able to experience this growth that we talked about tonight. And, and, and our, as our brother Robert just affirmed to us, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Amen. Amen.